morning, everybody. Good morning, Sean. The silence is a good time to begin. <laughs> well, good. Welcome to our celebration this morning. So if you're joining us in person, joining us on Zoom, and indeed if you're here for the first time, you're particularly welcome. During our time of worship and our exploration of the scriptures this morning, we will be speaking about our God. Now the world is full of notions about God and about who God is. So this morning I just want to read two verses from Peter's epistle. Peter who claimed to be an eyewitness of the revelation and glory of God. And him in his epistle he says this, speaking about Jesus, he said, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. He was foreordained. God is a God who plans. God is a God who has purposes. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world. God isn't limited by our concept of time and physics. <coughs> Indeed, God laid <coughs> the foundations of the world. Peter says that Jesus was revealed in these last times. God not only plans, not only has purposes, but he carries out those plans in his way and in his time. And what was his primary plan? To reveal Jesus. Why? He tells us here. For us. Everything God plans, everything God purposes is for <coughs> us. He makes it possible for us to believe in God, to approach God. It says in verse 21 that he raised Jesus from the dead. This is our God. He raises people from the dead. He raised Jesus from the dead. He will raise us from the dead. Now that might sound actually like a bit of a daunting prospect to some. But when God raised Jesus from the dead, he gave him glory, and he invites us to partake in that glory, so that our hope and our faith are in God. God gives us hope, and God gives us faith, and God makes us part of his glory. He wants our relationship with him to be one of faith, hope, and glory, because our God is a God of revelation and relationship. Amen? Amen. So let's lift our hearts and our voices in praise to Him.
But if I told you that these words that we're going to read were spoken to a people whose lives had been devastated, everything they held dear was taken from them, their daily life was a struggle, they were afflicted, they were suffering, and they felt forsaken. Perhaps you could relate to that. Wouldn't you like to know what God would speak to you in that situation? And if you're going through suffering and affliction, wouldn't you love to know what God would speak to you, to you personally, to you as an individual? Now I know for a fact that there has been a lot of affliction, a lot of suffering, even among us. We had a funeral here this week, for example. You could say, well, that, that was the life where I lived, and okay, it's bereavement is bereavement. My dad will be 10 years dead this year. It seems like yesterday. But apart from that, there's the problem of housing, and physical illness, and financial burden, and relationship problems, and, you know, this, the list goes on. But uh, wouldn't you love to know what God would speak to you in that situation? Well, the good news, my friends, is that God comes and speak to, speaks to us in our brokenness. In fact, God can only ever speak to us in our brokenness. Because if God was waiting for us to be fixed before he could speak to us, that would never happen. We're broken. And thank God for his love and his mercy that he speaks to us in our brokenness. Now the children of Israel felt forsaken because they had been engaged in a battle with the Babylonians and they lost the war. And their city, Jerusalem, was in ruins. <coughs> the walls and the gates of the temple were destroyed. The young men were killed in battle, the women were carried off, the survivors were taken into captivity. And in the words of the prophet Jeremiah, who himself was an eyewitness to the destruction, he summarized it succinctly when he said that the enemy has triumphed and prevailed because Jerusalem has sinned grievously. In the words of one commentator, <coughs> the smoking ruins of Zion lie behind these chapters in Isaiah. So the background is that they're in captivity. Back in Jerusalem, there's still smoke fresh smoke coming out of the ruins of their defeat. Israel here is personified as a widow in bereavement, a widow who has lost her husband, that is her main city, Jerusalem, and her children. She's bereaved, she's got no children. <coughs> she's sitting there in misery, her children are either dead or made captive. And as we read this ancient text, we will come across a few characters, principally the servant of the Lord, and the Lord God Almighty who commissions the servant, and they are speaking to each other, we get to listen in, and they are also speaking to the coastlands. The coastlands is Bible speak for everybody. The coastlands is Bible speak for the people who live far away, for all the nations, to the end of the earth. But the conversation is also directed to Israel, which is also known as Jacob, and sometimes called Zion. And we get to hear God's plan of salvation. We get to hear his promise of restoration. And we get to read about the pity with which he leads his people. So my friends, if you are able-bodied, please stand with me as we read Isaiah chapter 49. If you are not able-bodied, please just sit and enjoy God's word. Isaiah 49. The servant is speaking. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword, in the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow, in his quiver he hid me away, and he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And I said, I've labored in vain, I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him, 
For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful. Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out, and to those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways, on all their heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, by the scorching wind, nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sain. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders make haste, your destroyers, and those who laid you waste go out from me. Lift up your eyes all round and see. They all gather, they come to you as I live, declares the Lord. You shall put them on as an ornament. You shall bind them on as a bride does. Surely your waste and your desolate places and your devastated land, surely now you will be too narrow for your inhabitants, and those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children of your bereavement will yet say in your ears, the place is too narrow for me, make room for me to dwell in. And then you will say in your heart, Who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. But who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. From where have these come? Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples. And they shall bring your sons in their bosom and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens, your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Can the prey be taken from the mighty, or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with wine. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord your God, your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Hallelujah. Amen. Wow. <coughs> oh Lord, I thank you for your word, and I pray that you will accomplish within us your purpose this morning, that you will glorify your name. You have multiplied, O oh Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. That's going to be hard to see. Can I turn on these lights? Maybe. This might have to do. Thanks. Brilliant. It's still hard to see. So I was playing with word art. You know that thing you go online and you can put in all the words that have come into the chat. And uh, here, here is the word art of Isaiah chapter 49. Now it doesn't include all the words, um, but it, I picked out a few of the 
principal ones. Are. There are other principal ones that I could have picked out. The size of the word has nothing to do with the significance of the word either. But I just thought, how interesting, reading through Isaiah 49. What is the summary paragraph? We are called to listen to a chosen servant who has been named from the womb. He was born with a sharp sword in his mouth to glorify the Lord God. He declared a time of favor in which he would gather Israel and the nations. He was given as a covenant uh, to the people. Uh, though he was despised and forsaken, yet he heralded a day of salvation that reached to the ends of the earth. And those who enjoy his salvation hunger no more, neither thirst. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. They shall be led by pastures and springs of living water, and the kings of the earth will serve in his kingdom. Hallelujah. Does that sound familiar? It should. What comes to my mind is a, a, a voice only choir, you know, a cappella. So eight, like on YouTube, you say like eight, eight voices singing together. And each part singing their own, each voice singing their own part. And even in, within the prophecy of Isaiah, we have the, the voice of the promised child. Then we have the light to those in darkness. Then we have the stone that was rejected by men but chosen by God. And then we have another voice coming in, the suffering servant. And then we have the messianic king. And then we have the triumph of new creation. And all these motifs coming and blending together as one sound. I imagine like in a cathedral, you know, very high walls, vaulted ceilings, the sound reverberating off the walls, the acoustics are brilliant, and the echoes coming in and amplifying the sound, and all of those wonderful truths resonating throughout the whole building come to their full clarity in the New Testament. The words and the ideas of Isaiah appear over 400 times in the New Testament. It depends on which commentary you read. Either citations or quotations or allusions or echoes. So sometimes the writer of the New Testament will say, as the prophet Isaiah said, and then he'll say it. Or sometimes he will just say something that Isaiah said without saying that Isaiah said it. He'll just say it. That's a citation. Sometimes he will talk about the same ideas that Isaiah spoke about. And it might just be a part of an idea, but it's part of the culture of his present day. So when he's communicating, when the New Testament writer is writing down as the Spirit inspires him, he's taking from Isaiah all of these different bits and pieces. And then there are echoes. That is, even just words that will mean something within a culture. So for example, if I said San for Mayo, that would make no sense to anybody who didn't know about Sam from Ego, right? It's an echo. So if I bring it into my conversation, that, okay, it's half illusion, it's, it's echo. The thing is that the scriptures are a unified whole. And the truths that God expresses in Isaiah and in the rest of the Old Testament blend seamlessly into everything that we read in the New Testament. And so we have one word of God which comes together in its full clarity. We have the, the privileged position of being able to look back at the whole of Scripture and see the story of salvation unfold. What a wonderful thing. So now I'm going to read Isaiah 49, but this time I'm going to read it from the New Testament. Now if you see at the top there, that's going to change. As I go through. I'm just going to read out a few verses basically. So for example, after Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath, the Pharisees went out and conspired against him to destroy him, but Jesus became, was aware of it, and he, went, he withdrew and then he followed him, and he healed all of them and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. But I jumped right into the middle of Jesus' life. Let me go back to the beginning. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, 
Joseph, son of God, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And when Jesus came of age, he took the scroll of the synagogue that says, Captives rescued, take my word for it. He took the scroll and he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. In due course, a voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. But he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, that the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause, despised. Jesus went over Jerusalem. All Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often will I gather <coughs> your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you will not win. He took a cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus prayed, Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. As he hung on the cross, Jesus bore our forsakenness. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After Pentecost, Peter addressed the crowd and said, Brothers, I know you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, be thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Turn back. Later, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That says ends of the earth, if you read in Isaiah 49. And so Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, was able to declare, Behold, now is a favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. John, in his revelation vision, saw Jesus. And in his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And one of the elders came to John and said, Those who have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. Sorry, you can't see that. Springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into the city of God. And the host will sing, Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He took on the form of a servant. Hallelujah. My friends, we do not yet see all things as they should be. And although nothing is outside of God's control, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we do see Jesus. He is the chosen servant, named from the womb, sent by the Father to Israel and to the nations, in a time of favor to save us from our sins, to gather us back to God, 
He was given as a covenant for the people, for our salvation. He was despised and rejected and forsaken. And yet by his life and death, he glorified God and atoned for our sin. And so God honored him, crowned him with glory, exalted him above every name. So he is the king of kings. And kings and princes shall prostrate themselves. And all nations shall bow before him whose word is final. And those who are washed by him find favor with God. They neither hunger nor thirst. They are led with compassion to rich pasture and springs of living water. Delivered and protected from the enemy, with everlasting joy upon their heads, they sing the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. <laughs> if I was better with uh, the tech, I could have had the words come up and go down. You know? <laughs> that would require seven months of training. <laughs> but it just struck me how, you know, well, put it like this I heard a professor of Old Testament giving a, a devotional one day in his seminary. I heard it online. And he's a professor of Old Testament. And he confessed to the seminary students. He said, he said sometimes I do read the New Testament. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the whole gospel is in the Old Testament. That's why St. Augustine said, let me see if I can get this right now, the New Testament is in the Old Consulate, and the Old is in the New Revealed we get to see so much more richness when we have the whole scripture. Like if we just have that bit here and a bit there, okay, it's wonderful. A standalone verse would be wonderful, life-changing even. But for a Christian life, for a walk with God, we want to study the scriptures and see the full richness of what God has for us. Now having said that, we've only scratched the surface. You know, there was a pastor called, I think his name was Joseph Carlyle. And uh, he, he lived now a few hundred years ago. I'm a bit shaky on the precise details. But this I know, he preached from Job. He went right through Job. Did I say this before? He went right through Job. It only took him 240 sermons. <laughs> over a long number of years to the one congregation. And uh, at the very end of the last sermon, he apologized that he had skipped over some verses a bit too quickly. <laughs> now we're going through Isaiah. <laughs> we're on chapter 49. We've had 49 sessions, we have a few more to go. But um, I thought, well, that's very interesting, isn't it? How much time you spend on a particular series or, or a book. But the Lord does have some treasures for us here, I think, doesn't he? We've only scratched the surface. And uh, what happens is that when the preacher has finished studying, say, Philippians or Nehemiah or Isaiah, and then at the very end they realize, oh, okay, I'm beginning to understand it now. They want to go back and start again. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> We're only scratching the surface. We could develop so many themes here. For example, what about the honor that the Holy One of Israel bestowed on the servant? What about the faithfulness of the Holy One of Israel to his people, even when they turned against him? What about the adornment of the bride? Did you get that bit? What about the multitudes who come into his kingdom from the four corners of the earth, every tribe and language and people? Tongue. What about the kings and the queens who come in to serve in the kingdom of God? I love that one. Our highest honor bows before him. Did you see the coronation of the king recently? A lot of pomp and ceremony. Yeah. Fades to nothing. Hallelujah. But 
There are two themes that I want to bring out today. Firstly, the defeat of the tyrant. And secondly, the comfort of God. In verse 24 we read, Can the prey be taken from the mighty? Or can the captives of a tyrant be rescued? And the answer from the Lord God, the mighty one of Jacob, is yes, they can. The captives of the tyrant, the captive of the mighty, can be rescued. <coughs> And the Lord puts it like this, he says, I will contend with those who contend with you. It's a wonderful thing. The Lord will speak for us and will fight for us. You see, nobody can hold you against his will. They might hold you against your will, but nobody can hold you against his will. Even if you are imprisoned through your own fault, through your own poor choices, to your outright sin. Yet even to you, the Lord will say that he can deliver you from the tyranny of sin and from the tyranny of Satan. Nothing can hold you. Nothing can keep you away from God in that sense. And he will say to the prisoners, come out. And to those who are locked up in darkness, appear. So if I may ask you, don't, don't put up your hand. But if I may ask you, are you living in the light? Or are you feeling locked up in darkness? If you are feeling locked up in darkness, if you are feeling defeated by the enemy, if you are feeling oppressed by your circumstances even, then know this, that God can rescue you even in your captivity. The truth is that every single one of us was captive until Jesus set us free and rescued us. Every single one of us. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Please don't leave here this morning still struggling as a captive. If you feel that you're struggling as a captive, let Jesus rescue you, even now, even before I finish me. Nothing to do with me, it's Jesus and his work. And now I want to come to the comfort of God. We're going to be finished very early this morning. And a woman forget her nursing child. In verse 10 we read, He who has pity on them will weep them. It's a pity that Arsenal threw away the title. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity that Liverpool aren't meant to qualify for the Champions League. <coughs> it's a pity we are at one. No, that's not what we're talking about. That's not the pity that we're talking about here. It's, it's, there's no regret. It's, it's not that, oh, I wish something else happened. No, that's not the pity that God is talking about. God is saying, with pity, I will lead them. And the Hebrew word is raham. Raham. Which means to love deeply. It means to love with compassion. And it means to love with deep tenderness. It's the deep tenderness that is built upon a bond, mother and child. When my firstborn was holding her firstborn, I could see the love, the bond between them that was just oozing from my firstborn. And I said to her, you see that feeling there? That feeling you've got there now? That never goes away. It's there. It's instinct. But of course, in other words, it's in the very nature of God to have pity. Now the word pity here in the Hebrew does have this sense of the superior coming to help the inferior. The strong coming to help the weak. 
It is the sort of thing that is evoked from us when we see somebody in need. We have pity on them. We see them in need, and that need, that weakness, that vulnerability evokes a very strong emotion within us. It's pity. It's deep, tender love and compassion. And the more miserable or even degraded that we are in our situation, the more pity is evoked from within us. So when we see the devastation of war, when we see the devastation of famine, or we see the devastation of crime, then something deep within us is evoked, and that's pity. And this is the sort of thing that, that drives God. This is the thing that our Heavenly Father has for us. I find it indescribable. It is indescribable. See, <coughs> some people think that God has a big stick. And that that's what he drives us with. That's wrong. Some people think that the God of the Old Testament has a big stick. But that's wrong. Some people think that love doesn't feature much in the Old Testament. That's completely wrong. Look what we've just read. We have read about a, an indescribable love, mercy, compassion, that God has for his people. And that's what motivates him towards us. That's how he deals with us. That's how he dealt with me, I can tell you for sure. He did not bring a big stick to me. And in the, in the definition, it talks about a degraded condition. So if, if the object is degraded, then we're, the pity is drawn out of us. And I think the children of Israel, as they sat in Babylon, they were degraded. They were in a terrible state. And we also are in a terrible state when God first comes to us. And that's the state where God comes with pity, compassion, deep, tender love, and draws you to himself. That's his love, that's his heart, that's his word to us this morning. And that's his word to you as an individual. So it's too easy to sit in, in the crowd and say, well, that's not for me. No, no, no. This is God's word for you individually. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he spoke about the body of Christ and you individually who are members of it. So there is the corporate, absolutely crucial. And in fact, we've lost sight of that largely in Western culture. But there is also the individual aspect whereby Almighty God in heaven, who reigns on high, who is sovereign, declares his undying love for each one of us. Hallelujah. It's not a stick. It is not a stick. It is his undying love. So much so, he sent his servant. So much so, the servant was despised and abhorred and rejected, but still, he bore our shame on the cross. And because he took away our sin, we have been gathered back to God, our Father. Hallelujah. Yes. What a joy for us, isn't it? What a joy. So no wonder then there is cosmic rejoicing. In verse 13 we read, Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. Did you feel afflicted this morning? Know that God has compassion. God has compassion for us. Now I'm thinking of people in pain. I'm thinking of people emotionally in pain, mentally locked up, tripping over, and frustrated by illness. And the list goes on. Even in my own family, there is pain. And you'll have heard Ethan pray recently about suffering. It's a very real thing, my friends. The comfort for me is that God is mindful of it and that he is compassionate towards us in it. And that he, in that sense, walks with us and has pity <coughs> upon us. He takes no pleasure in inflicting pain on anybody. 
Okay, so there are things we don't understand. There are things we, we pray for. Paul himself prayed for things that were not removed. And, uh, Lord, give us that spiritual maturity to see beyond the immediate and to see beyond the immediate circumstance and even within the affliction to realize that God is comforting us supernaturally by the work of his Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds. If that doesn't happen, we're no different from anybody else. If that does happen. The peace that passes understanding, the peace that defies explanation, the comfort that defies explanation, that we feel in the depths of our hearts, knowing that our loving Father cares for us and is with us and has compassion for us and has pity on us. Amen. So my friends, let's sing with the heavens and exult with the earth. And let's break forth into singing. <laughs> for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted.
thank you to the band. And um, I was just looking for a verse that says, preachers shouldn't bring up football teams when they're preaching. Um, that was no joke. <laughs> but in, in Matthew 9, uh, uh, 36 said, uh, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So we have a God who has pity, has compassion, has tender love. Uh, so we're grateful uh, to have a God like that. And I hope you know him personally. Uh, so we're going to have uh, tea and coffee now, so uh, don't rush out. And then at half 12, we're going to have our baptism class. Uh, if, you just, if you're interested to know what baptism is, what it's all about, uh, so that class would, um, you should probably not call it a class. It should just like a mini information, um, looking through the Bible, what baptism is, and who can get baptized, uh, can babies get baptized, that sort of thing. So we'll keep off exactly at half 12. Uh, so with that, let me just uh, close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are a compassionate and gracious God. Yes. A God who has pity on us. Uh, a God who pursues us. Um, St. Christ come and die on the cross for us. So I do pray that we hold these things dear to our hearts. And just know that no one can ever take them away from us. We pray these things in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.